given the finished presentation, I was asked to do three things. I was asked to provide a product history of the education system in Northern Ireland from whenever to uh, uh, I was asked uh, uh, in the current situation to, to quickly run through the sort of challenges which the system is facing uh, and then to come up with some creative solutions or to offer some, some creative solutions on uh, how it might be dealt with. Uh, so this is going to be fast, so apologies in advance, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff we want to run through. Uh, and basically the overriding thing and what I want to talk about is the, um, the relationship between uh, the churches and the schools and how that has played out over, over time. So if we begin with the, um, with the first point, looking at some aspects of, of history, what I want to do is just to identify a number of key historical points just to illustrate some of the change that's happened in the system uh, over time. And there's a whole range of different places you could start, but uh, it said it started in the 1830s with the establishment of the national school system. Uh, and uh, most people, or many people involved in education won't be aware of the, the Stanley letter. Actually, there were two Stanley letters, but they both pretty much said the same things. So we're not sure which one was actually used. Uh, but uh, the Stanley letter basically tried to lay down a framework for a national school system in Ireland. Uh, and one of the um, aspirations in the Stanley Letter was that the, uh, the system should be non-denominational. Uh, they wanted to keep release, release, specific denominational education outside the normal school day. It could be taught but, uh, outside the normal school day, but the schools would still be infused with moral and religious values in a broader sense. But this was an attempt to try and create a national school system uh, to which young people from all different backgrounds on, on, on the island could, uh, could uh, come together. Shortly after that, in 1845, there was a proposal to establish the Queen's Colleges, three colleges, as it turned out, one in Belfast, which was to go on to become my alma mater, uh, one in Cork and one in Galway. Daniel O'Connell at the time uh, made a, a lot of pressure that the Cork and Galway Colleges should become Catholic universities. And there was similar pressure in the north that uh, the Belfast College, or what was to become Queen's University Belfast, would be a Presbyterian college. But the authorities in Dublin Castle were very adamant that the, the model they had adopted for the national school system, that is to say, where the institutions would be infused by moral and religious values, but specific denominational uh, instruction uh, or uh, aspects would be dealt with uh, outside the, the official context of the institution, that was to hold in this particular instance as well. Uh, so the, uh, the colleges weren't to have any religious test on entry, and they weren't to have institutes uh, or uh, faculties of theology to train clergy. Um, and in the case of Queen's University of Belfast, that still is the, the ruling system in which we operate, so we still don't train clergy, we still don't have religious tests, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether we still have any morality. Um, <laughs> leaving aside, the, uh, moving on then to the next sort of step in the process, 1923 after partition, the first um, Minister of Education in Northern Ireland, Lord Londonderry, uh, he wanted to try and move the education system in Northern Ireland in a new direction. He wanted to make a formal break with the old national school system, and he wanted to try and reorient the school system in Northern Ireland uh, into the similar sort of lines of direction that had been followed in England in the latter part of the 19th century, in which the churches, by and large, were taken out or removed from a role in education, uh, and local authorities took over that role. Uh, so the proposals which Londonary came forward uh, tried to encourage all of the churches to hand their schools over to new local authorities, uh, and uh, given the sort of context of the time, he offered a number of different models in the hope that the Protestant churches would hand the schools over uh, there and then. The Catholic Church would think about it and operate a compromise model uh, and uh, hopefully at some point in the future the entirety of the school sector could move under the new local authority arrangements. When the proposals were put in place, nothing happened because nobody handed anything over. And so Lord London was left sitting with an idea that wasn't being put into practice. Uh, over the next number of years, the Protestant churches lobbied through the Prime Minister's office to get some uh, amendments to legislation so that whenever they handed the schools over, they could have an effective uh, influence and role in the new uh, county uh, schools. The Catholic Church was adamant that they were not in the least bit interested in handing the schools over to anyone because they wanted to keep holding on to the schools themselves. So in a relatively short period of time, we had a de facto denominationally separate system established with little prospect at that stage uh, of any change. In some senses, this was confirmed and settled in the post-war period. In 1947, we introduced free secondary education uh, and started off a process of building a whole series of new schools. Um, by this point, the Protestant churches had largely handed out over all their schools to the local authorities, but with uh, a continuing role and influence in the, uh, the boards of those schools. After 1947, in a, in a way which illustrates the, the sort of institutionalization of this de facto separation in the system, 
any new state schools that were built were treated as if they had at one point been owned by the Protestant churches and transferred over, and therefore they were given automatic rights of representation on those schools. So the sort of de facto separation, institutional separation, was maintained. Quickly moving on, uh, in the 1980s, uh, 1981, the first integrated school opened up. There had been pressure for integrated schools, formally planned integrated schools in the 1970s. Most of the, uh, uh, the big institutions and interests involved in education, in response to the pressure, said it would be a really good idea if there were integrated schools, but none of them actually did very much about making it happen. So parents got together and decided to do it themselves. In 1981, Lagan College was opened in order to demonstrate that it was possible and could be successful, and it was possible and it was successful. And uh, we now have an integrated sector with about 65 uh, schools involved in about 6% of the um, school age population. And uh, the, uh, one of the things which is interesting about the integrated sector is that there are very few instances anywhere in the world where an entirely new sector of schools has been brought into being largely because of the commitment and the will of parents. It's very, very unusual to see that happen, and it's an extraordinary achievement in many respects. I'll be coming back to, to, more, to slightly more critical comments about its impact uh, later on. Next step in the process in the 1990s, uh, partly as a consequence of the um, uh, Anglo-Irish Agreement, partly as a consequence of debates around the reformulation of community relations policy, partly because of a, uh, the consequences of a debate around equality in Northern Ireland at the time. Uh, there was a legislative change to allow equal funding for Catholic schools, so that effectively all schools, regardless of the sector, were put on an equal, uh, had the potential to be put a, a, on an equal funding uh, position, which was quite important in regards to the sort of wider context of, of the period. And I think helped to provide some of the important um, sort of environment, which led uh, eventually to the peace process. Uh, jumping ahead again, in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement, or Belfast Agreement. Uh, which uh, had a specific commitment recognising the importance of integrated education, but also a, a commitment recognising Irish medium education and, uh, and, and recognising some importance to Ulster uh, Scots culture uh, in a sort of a compromise to try to keep everyone happy. And that led in, in, in the 2000s to a debate, uh, as many of you will remember and who have been involved in, over whether we were to move in future in the direction of a shared future or effectively a shared out future. Where we're going to try and uh, quite uh, deliberately, as a, as a matter of course, create a more interconnected society, or would politics in Northern, Northern Ireland be simply about managing difference and allowing difference to, to flourish in the system? And in some senses, I think uh, a part, important parts of the education debate uh, reflect around this, this option, this choice between a shared future or a shared right future. Okay, so that's the history bit. Next bit, the challenges. There's a variety of challenges faced in the system at the, at the moment. And I've just tried to highlight some of them here. Obviously, there are structural issues around the ongoing, uh, seemingly, well, actually endless debate about transfer and uh, the, the arrangements for post primary education. Uh, we've also, there's also been an important change in recent years with the establishment of very learning communities and a move to some extent towards uh, higher levels <coughs> of uh, collaboration between schools. But we still have to see the sort of full outworkings of how that idea might be carried forward. The level of the curriculum, we're now sort of largely at the point where the revised Northern Ireland curriculum has been put in place, although the failure to uh, sort out all the structural issues means that there's still sort of things that need to be tweaked on that. Uh, more specifically, the entitlement framework, uh, a mechanism put in place to try to ensure that every young person everywhere in Northern Ireland had access to the same wide range of curricular choice. Uh, it remains an aspiration rather than a reality, <coughs> uh, and that's uh, quite an important issue to be addressed at some point. Uh, in sort of broader terms, we still have a, a situation of fallen roles, uh, uh, particularly having an effect on the post-primary sector at the moment, uh, and within the post-primary sector, particularly having an impact on secondary schools, who at this stage are bearing the brunt of, of fallen roles as the grammar schools continue to uh, take up to capacity. Uh, and then there's the ever-present issue around rural schools, also affected by fallen roles, uh, and whether or not, or how we might preserve some, uh, some small rural schools to try and help uh, anchor uh, rural communities. Uh, and then, as we've just heard in the previous presentation, uh, there's uh, less and less money to do all of the extra things that uh, there are demands to, to do. Uh, and again, I think uh, one of the things that we need to think about in terms of addressing all of these challenges is the way in which we approach it. Do we try to find some sort of strategic, system-wide approach to dealing with these issues? Or, uh, as it's often the case when we're looking at uh, education issues in Northern Ireland, do we do it on a sector-by-sector -sector basis and try to work out some mechanism? Are doing it in those particular, those particular ways. Okay, moving on to um, creative solutions. 
uh, particularly around the whole issue of how we deal with the, um, <coughs> uh, uh, these relationships between denominations and the church and the separate schools and, uh, and what should be done there. If we look over the last 30 years or so, there's uh, three main uh, sort of strategic approaches that have been put into, or levels of interventions that have been put into place to try and address issues around difference and to try to provide some basis for promoting greater understanding or reconciliation. Uh, and I've sort of summarised the three, uh, the three um, processes that have been put in place here by uh, pointing to the curriculum, curricular interventions, uh, how we teach history, how we teach religious education, how we teach education for mutual understanding, or at the present time, how we uh, teach issues around citizenship uh, in a place where the very notion of citizenship is a highly contested, contested term. So over the last 30 years, a lot of work has been done around different forms of curricular inter interventions. Uh, another big area of work over a long period has been around the development of contact programmes. Uh, involving young people from, school, from different schools coming together uh, on educational activities or holiday activities. And for a period, this was the single biggest area of activity supported by the Department of Education in terms of the, the money that was poured into it. The third area I've already alluded to, and that is the development of the integrated school sector, uh, based on the idea that the sort of contact systems that were in place were uh, inadequate uh, and partial, uh, and that the only way you could actually address the problem of difference was to break it down altogether by creating an integrated sector. Uh, my own sense is if you look at the evidence on the impact of a lot of these measures over time is that there are some very good things, some absolutely mind-blowingly inspirational things have been done. An awful lot of the money has been spent on things that are of little or no consequence. There's been an occasion where some of this work has actually done harm, but fortunately not very much of it. But the, the biggest disappointment in a sense is for people who are committed to trying to make this, this all work, I think, is that there's not much evidence of system-wide change as a consequence of these areas. There's some really amazing work being done in some places, some amazing lessons have been learned in some places, but the system as itself has remained, I think, uh, somewhat immune from the impact of some of the innovations and ideas that have been developed in all of this work. And so that led some of us to start thinking about the possibility of a middle way, uh, another way that's trying to combine structure and process rather than seeing, seeing them as separate elements. Uh, and I've sort of tried to capture this middle way in some senses in this uh, slide where if we take as one point on the polarity, the idea of having a system which we, we have had for most of our his history, where schools are largely uh, separate uh, uh, and we, if we want to try and address issues within the schools, we're making interventions accept them by uh, the sort of separate nature of the system. Right, so the other end of the polarity where we try to create a fully integrated system uh, where the separation is dissolved in a single or unitary system of schools. Uh, in practice, what we, uh, given the, 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 the lack of a broader system impacts, some of us thought it might be possible to find a way, a way where we could, uh, in a sense, deal with the system of separate schools and deal with the, the sort of issues around identity, but rather than try to change the system in total and one go, see if there's a way we can accept those institutional boundaries between young people, but dissolve the boundaries. Would it be possible to develop collaborative networks where young people move between schools, teachers move between schools, uh, in a way that they were sharing classes, wearing a different uni uniforms, recognising that they were doing this, and they were sort of trying to change the dynamic of the relationship between the schools. So a few years uh, ago, with the support from uh, a couple of important funders, we had an opportunity to try out these collaborative models. Uh, in the, one of the uh, cohorts we worked with, 65 schools in the Sharing Education Programme, uh, 65 schools in 12 different partnerships, uh, working between 2007 and 2010, uh, we went to the teachers and we basically said, here's an idea we want to try. We can give you some resources to support it if you're prepared to try it out. We don't know how to, how to do it. We're dependent on your professionalism and expertise to try and identify solutions, try them out. And we won't get upset if we fail as long as we learn from that. But we hope we can learn some lessons that we can maybe apply to, at a wider system level. Uh, and over the three years of that work, the schools responded and the teachers responded and pupils responded in a way which was absolutely uh, astonishing. Uh, we have, uh, in those schools, in those 12 partnerships, we have uh, we managed to create a situation where there are about 4,000 pupils moving on a routine basis, weekly, between, uh, between the schools, taking the classes in each other's schools. The teachers uh, are of the view that this significantly enhanced the educational experience and opportunity available to the young people. We have evidence that there were significant reconciliation effects. And a lot of the problems that were involved in this weren't big problems, they were little problems, practical problems, about making collaboration work. So we're now working with the second cohort uh, of, uh, of schools and other 12 partnerships at the moment involving about 61 schools where we're tightening up the parameters of the model to try and see if we can make this effective collaboration work to change the system. 
uh, and then try to uh, convince, persuade the Department of Education and our politicians that this could be a model for the future. And if we can get this working, which is effectively an integrated system, then who knows where this might go in the future, but we can leave it up to people in the future to decide what sort of future education system they want. Thank you.